Welcome to another episode of the Corporate Cowboys Podcast. I'm your host, Alex, and this podcast is powered by Incorporating Associates. Today's date is June 20, 2022. Join me as I continue reading Chapter 4 of Stuck, How to Win at Work by Understanding Loss. This is an audiobook experience. The authors are Victoria Grady and Patrick McCreesh. The publisher is Productivity Press, and publishing date is 2022. So yeah, it was published this year. I get and I understand that I'm taking valuable, crucial podcast space, crucial podcast airtime by reading this book. But not only do I believe that the book has some valuable information in it, seeing as how it was published 2022. And uh, I'm trying to uh, take advantage of that fact by being not only the first to bring it to you, but also to comment on it. I'm treating it as a form of uh, speech therapy for myself in order to better pronunciate, uh, enunciate, and syllabize these words in order that I might become a better orator and spokesperson as the as a as the potential face for the organization keep this organization not for profit by the way and its programming non profit by visiting us on patreon that's the corporate cowboys podcast there are multiple tiers that you could sign up for and uh, you know subscribe you can shoot us a little a little something something every month or if you want to shoot us a one-time donation, I don't know, maybe your life estates, your, your, your life savings or something, <laughs> nothing crazy, you can do that. There's some links floating around. There's a, a, a paypal.me. Uh, that would be a direct to the organization. There's a cash app, a Venmo, and that comes to us as well. Any money that I handle goes to the org, and that keeps it not-for-profit going towards business expenses and legal fees. You know how that goes. Onward to chapter four. How do I get stuck? Every human is like all other humans. This is a quote. Every human is like all other humans, some other humans, and no other human. That's by Clyde Cluckhone. Cluckhone. Every human is like all other humans, some other humans, and no other human. I like that quote. Another quote is, it is not what happens to us, but our response to what happens to us that hurts us. So your response is what hurts you. If, you, if your response is to react, right? If your response is to react in a in a, in a, in a in an emotional outburst, recognizing physical pain. That's what I gather from that quote. In an emotional outburst, acknowledging the physical pain, then that's going to be as if you hurt. But if you show no signs of being hurt, it is more than likely that you are able to supersede whatever had the, pot, the potential to hurt you. And that, that quote is by Stephen R. Covey, actually, a very another popular author. Venetia, that's V-E-N-E-T-I-A, Venetia Reyes. Venetia Reyes was the Employee Engagement and Communications Manager for Genentech Incorporated, a 10,000-person biotechnology division of the pharmaceutical multinational Roche, or Roche. I think there's supposed to be an accent on that. Roke somewhere. Roke. Genentech has a long history in the field of biotechnology and is consistently named one of the best places to work by Fortune. Between 2017 and 2018, Venetia was charged with rolling out multiple change initiatives related to business processes and structure. She wanted to understand the cohort of people she would ask to change. Venetia wanted to know who they were, how would they, how would they would what? Again, I do apologize. It's not me 
always. It's not always me who's fucking up the reading. Sometimes there are typographical errors and, and grammatical spelling errors in these editions of the book. So even though the words might be spelled correctly, and, and again, I'm putting my I'm putting myself in the shoes of the editor if they even had one because, you know, it's just published this year. I don't know how tight their processes are. If they need somebody to proofread, shit, outsource it. Outsource it. It doesn't have to be yourself. Between 2017 and 2018, Venetia was charged with rolling out multiple change initiatives related to business process and structure. She wanted to understand the cohort of people she would ask to change. Venetia wanted to know who they were, how would they would receive, how they would receive the change, how they might react, and what they could do to support them through the change. Venetia used a tool called the Attachment Styles Index to understand her team. This unique tool is designed around the concepts of attachments and focuses on how each person may react to a sense of loss. This tool helps identify each person's attachment style and explain how these styles may react to change. Venetia deployed the ASI with quantitative and qualitative questions and collected anonymous responses. The goal was to effectively understand the team, to design the change management strategy, and then align the structure and communications to the strategy for the effort. Overall, the cohort of Genentech employees impacted by the change were eager to provide data to better inform the change process. The employees were generally highly motivated and focused on all opportunities to proactively create an as, at sorry to proactively create an atmosphere atmosphere responsive to change consistent with their deep commitment to organizational values the employees were generally highly motivated and focused on all opportunities to proactively create an atmosphere responsive to change consistent with their deep commitment to organizational values i think that uh that focus that word focused is out of place there focused on all opportunities mm. I don't know. I think it threw off the rest of the sense, which made me get caught up on atmosphere. <laughs> the team was excited to integrate a forward focused tool that was consistent with the innovative focus at Genentech across the across the what across the group. Yeah, across the group because it's there twice again. Gramma grammatics, fucking grammar. Across the group that was studied, 73% of the respondents were securely attached in Genentech. Furthermore, we found that there was little variance in score over tenure, meaning that Venetia's most junior and most senior employees shared a healthy, stable attachment style. More later on on what this means. That's in parentheses. Genentech was one of the first companies to develop biotechnology harnessing the power of DNA. This is what excited employees to come to work and may have even been the foundation of employee attachment to Genentech and the mission. Venetia and her team harnessed this connection to history and her own team's stable attachment to this legacy to create a culture ready for change. The ASI helped Venetia design a change management strategy that aligned the messaging to the mission and mitigated the challenges and potential disruption. The team was focused on how to change on, sorry, the team was focused on how the change would help get them back to the mission of developing innovative medicines to improve the overall health of the world. As we saw in the previous chapter, our experiences lead us to very different understandings of attachment. Our early interactions with parents and caretakers certainly impact how we develop, but this also evolves over our lifetime throughout other, through other experiences. Mm -hmm. Our early interactions with parents and caretakers certainly impact how we develop, but this also evolves over our lifetime through other experiences. This evolution leads us to develop our own type of attachment. These are called attachment styles. 
Attachment style is defined as an individual's patterns of expectations, needs, emotions, and social behavior that result from a particular history of attachment experiences, usually the beginning in relationship, usually, sorry, attachment style is defined as an individual's patterns, an individual's patterns of expectations, needs, emotions, and social behavior that result from a particular history of attachment experiences, usually beginning in relationship with parents. The attachment style is not a personality type, but our attachment style sits underneath our personal attitudes, sorry, our personal attributes, and explains some important parts of our personality. The attachment style is not a personality type, but our attachment style sits underneath our personal attributes and explains some important parts of our personality. Our style does not determine how we respond to every situation in the workplace, but it is a strong signal for how we will respond to many situations. And our attachment style does not determine how we will work with our fellow team members, but it is a strong predictor of how we will interact with colleagues. Therefore, our attachment styles set the base from which many of the common organizational assessments and managerial challenges stem. In this chapter, we will explore a uh, point. How do we stick differently through different attachment styles? Point. How do we identify our attachment style? Point. What is the impact of our attachment style? What is the impact of an attachment style to, on you? What is the impact of an attachment style on you? And then last point, how does your attachment style impact the way you show up at work? The first, attachment styles. Attachment styles are the visible signals of the lifelong developmental experience that each person has with relationships. Our first interactions with caretakers set the stage for this style. These experiences can set what is referred to as a secure base. This would be a healthy attachment with a caretaker that is managed in a healthy way towards separation and individual development. Over time, this initial secure base is reinforced with more positive relationships that reinforce the construct toward a secure attachment style through life. Alternatively, even a secure base may be consistently challenged at a young developmental age which would undercut the base and create different tendencies. It is important to go back to our chapter on the brain and understand how this style is formed biologically. During the de de during the de <laughs> during the de developmental process, during the developmental process, I, don't, I got me got caught up on developmental. During the developmental process, the intuitive brain, the limbic system, is writing the emotional experiences encoded with memory, almost like a Rosetta Stone, for future reference. The early experiences of a secure base are being hardwired into us as learned positive feelings. That's warmth, comfort, protection, safety. As these are reinforced with other positive developmental experiences like academic, athletic, or community support, growth, care, growth, belonging. As these are reinforced with other positive developmental experiences like academic, athletic, or community support, care, growth, belonging. That, that sentence reads weird. It starts with a as, so it, it I would expect some kind of some kind of uh, meeting of some kind of meet halfway, so some kind of connection halfway through the sentence with, uh, with another subject predicate. All right, but I, I guess not. It's just the way it's worded. As these are reinforced, the, the, the experiences, that is the experiences being reinforced and those positive feelings. As these are reinforced with other positive developmental experiences like academic, athletic, or community supports. That's care, growth, belonging. 
These secure feelings stay with us via our intuitive brain through our working life, and we feel it through professional support, respect, opportunity, development, growth. When we see someone who demonstrates these feelings back in the workplace, we tend to use a casual lexicon. Sometimes we call the person secure, but more often we may think of some of the traits we see. We call them confident or social. The flip side of this secure base is an insecure base. Perhaps a person did not have a healthy separation from an initial caretaker, leaving some negative feelings like longing, concern, loss. As the person grows, these emotions written into the intuitive brain are reinforced with more negative feelings through school, church, or activities. That's loneliness, frustration, shame. Just like the secure base, this negative cycle will carry into the working world but may lead to feelings of isolation or delayed development. Again, our language can often be casual. Instead of confidence in social behavior, we see someone who is withdrawn and shy. We often label this type of behavior with the catch-all phrase of insecurity. While this is right on one hand, while this is right on one hand, as it is opposite of a secure base, the truth is more complicated. Insecure behaviors come in many different forms, and some of these behaviors have advantages in the working world that will be highlighted in this chapter. As you can see from the way attachment styles are formed, they generally do not change much over our lives. They may adjust a slightly, they may adjust a slightly with experience. They may they may adjust a slightly. They may adjust slightly. Yeah, the A is just extra. <laughs> they may adjust slightly with experiences, but because we enter situations with the preconceived mental model and add the experience to that model, it is hard to adjust the style significantly. There is research that shows a significant life event that dramatically shift our attachment styles, but these are not common. There is research that shows a significant life event can dramatically shift. Did I misread that? Did I just blank out and misread that? There is research that shows a significant life event can dramatically shift our attachment styles, but these are not common. Yeah, significant life events are not common, I guess. The more common reality is that our attachment styles drive much of our behavior in the working world. These styles determine how we show up at the office, how we interact with our colleagues, how we form relationships, how we set our priorities, and often how we respond to change in the organization. While research agrees that secure is an attachment style, there is some debate related to how to categorize the other styles. Some suggest there are only two other styles, ambivalent and avoidant. Our research demonstrates three clear other attachment styles. That, that shit there is misworded somehow. Our research demonstrates th three other clear, yeah, three other clear attachment styles. I, I guess if they want to, they, they want to clarify what those attachment styles are, this, this, the way it's worded, it's kind of, um, trippy. Our research demonstrates three other, no, I see that was me saying it. It's written as our research demonstrates three clear other attachment styles. See, three clear other attachment styles, dismissive, preoccupied, and fearful. However, and, and, and just a side note, and it is possible, it is possible that, that this is a, these are foreign authors who use the foreign editor. So, you know, typographical and or grammatical errors may be expected to an extent. But uh, again, I mean, with the way technology is nowadays, you can outsource that shit to somebody who could do it right. And, uh, you know, maybe this might help serve as a, as a sort of review of that person's work and whether or not you might contract with them in the future. <laughs> Our research demonstrates three... Three clear other attachment styles, dismissive, preoccupied, and fearful. However, we do not use these words for describing workplace attachments. The traditional words have clinical meanings that have come to carry certain judgments with them. 
that we do not intend to imply within the workplace. Instead, we use a different approach that allows for a more rounded view of each style. We use the following language in the workplace, where it refers to secure, we use stable, and these are in bullet points. Where it's referring to something secure, we use stable. Referring to something dismissive, we use autonomous. Where it's something preoccupied, we use distracted. When we're referring to fearful, we use insecure. So insecure, I guess, doesn't have a clinical definition or a clinical uh, application to it, a clinical meaning. We are going to use these workplace definitions for the remainder of the book as they are much more palatable for discussion among colleagues. That's stable, autonomous, distracted, and insecure. These four styles are defined by a combination of factors on a continuous spectrum of anxiety and avoidance. Anxiety in this context is exactly the way it was described in chapter two. It is the level of worry and concern that an individual feels based on their instinctual reaction to life experience. Avoidance is a measure of the person's sociability with others in the organization and includes how a person feels about others around them. As you can see in figure 4.1, those with the stable attachment style maintain low anxiety while demonstrating low avoidance. Somewhat similar but different, the autonomous attachment style is also low on anxiety, but not highly social. That would be uh, uh, where they're referring to autonomous. Remember, it's dismissive. Dismissive. Autonomous equals dismissive. Somewhat similar but different, the autonomous attachment style is also low on anxiety, but not highly social. This group is sometimes seen as having higher views of themselves than others. Yes, appearing dismissive. The distracted come to work with high anxiety. It may not be driven by work, but it shows up at work. However, when they try to engage heavily at work, it can lead to colleagues realizing and feeling their anxiety. And that's the preoccupied people. The preoccupied people are, are distracted, easily distracted. Because they're already preoccupied, that's why. You could just knock them off their course relatively easily. The insecure have high anxiety and high avoidance. They do not participate effectively in the workplace and can sometimes be seen as hiding. Let's go a little deeper into each one. Let's see, in figure 4.1, let me just use a couple of descriptive words to describe it for you. It is a cartograph. Yeah, it is like a, like a cartograph um, having four quadrants. Similar, you know, like an X, Y axis. Um, having four quadrants. And in the upper left, you have, well, I guess I could label the axis is for you, right? The, the Y axis is where the avoidance is. So the higher up you go on the Y, it's high avoidant. And the lower you go, it's low avoidant. And then the X axis is anxiety, where the further you go on the right, is high anxiety. The further you go on the left is low anxiety. So if you're on the left hand side, on the upper side, that's low anxiety on the X, high avoidant on the Y. And there you'll find the autonomous person, dismissive. That's low anxiety, high avoidance because they're not sociable like they just described. Now, if you go high anxiety, that's to the right, in the right quadrant, on the upper right quadrant, that's high anxiety, high avoidance, you find the insecure person. They're fearful. They're fearful. They don't operate too well in the workplace. And like the description said, they might you might find them to be hiding, uh, avo avoiding responsibility outright. Now, if you go on the bottom, bottom right, bottom right, that's going to be high anxiety on the x-axis, low avoidance on the y-axis, that's the distracted person. They are preoccupied. They're going to be easy. Again, they're going to be easy to distract and push off balance because they've already got shit to worry about. They're kind of, uh, they're kind of uh, frazzled, frazzled, if you will. 
And then if we go to the bottom left, so on the left hand side, on the low anxiety side of the X axis, low anxiety, and it's low avoidance on the Y axis, so that's on the bottom, bottom left, you'll find the stable person, the secure person. And uh, they're, they, the stable and secure person does not avoid people and can actually carry on a good conversation, are very social. That, I think, I believe, personally, is where every consummate professional wants to end up in life. Not low energy, right? You have, you have energy reserved. How's that? Not low energy, but reserved in energy. You don't need to express it. Like, the need isn't there, so you're not anxious. You're not anxious to express yourself. I mean, and I have a lot of energy, too. I mean, there are times when I reserve it. So there are times when I use it. And I personally, I love using the energy because we have, what, 18, not 18, maybe 18 hours, 18 hours in a day to just go ham, 100 miles an hour. And at the end of those 18 hours, I want to drop dead and, and sleep. If I'm not dead, I want to sleep, right? And I don't want to stay up awake at night uh, thinking, thinking thoughts because I'm anxious. I might be eager for the next day, but I don't let anxiety keep me awake. And again, I don't avoid, uh, I don't, I don't avoid social situations either. Oh, check this out. The next portion, they're actually going to go through all those quadrants and actually explain low key, uh, what I just described to you. So the stable, stable individuals generally come to work with a positive attitude and have pot. Sorry, I got the hiccups. A little water. Stable individuals generally come to work with a positive attitude and have positive interactions with others. They have a positive view of themselves and a good understanding of their self-worth. They also have a positive view of others and tend to have the ability to easily trust, build relationships, and cooperate with others. Stable individuals will often have a strong goal orientation in their work. When combined with their strong sociability, it leads to the willingness to work alone if they have to and to work in teams when collaboration is required or provides more value. Uh, I'm just going to pause right there. Yeah, I think, I think I'm in that camp. I want to say I'm, a lot of my attributes will be found in that quadrant in this camp because I've grown professionally to the, to the level where you just got to recognize that legwork is required. Like it, it, someone has to put in work. Someone has to do dirt. Someone has to do the work. And if you don't have a team, you have to do it yourself. If you have a team, you better hope there you're, you're not just leading followers. You otherwise you're going to end up, or you're going to fall into micromanaging, right? So you need a team of individuals who, who are also capable of directing themselves. You need a team of stable individuals who can also work alone. If you give them a task, you don't have to constantly be overseeing them and checking for updates. You just know that you can hand off some work and it gets done. We are, um, when combined with their strong sociability, it leads to the willingness to work alone if they have to and to work in teams when collaboration is required or provides more value. They are willing to sacrifice their independence and credit in order to develop relationships with people in the organization. Stable individuals will not step on people to get ahead. This group may develop strong acquaintances at work and may not, or may not, sorry. This group may develop strong acquaintances at work or may not. That might be more situational. By and large, this attachment style tends to report high levels of engagement in the office and strong employee satisfaction. Stable individuals have a strong sense of what a secure base means and they strive to get back to that level emotion. Like everyone at work, stable individuals face times of challenge and conflict. They tend to address these periods by leveraging the secu their secure base they tend to address these periods by leveraging their secure base and using this to regulate their emotions. Again, this does not mean they lack frustration, but that they will quickly get back to balance. Therefore, 
if anxiety spikes, they will try to bring back to balance. They will try to bring back to balance. Therefore, if, if anxiety spikes, they will try to bring it back to balance. You see, I mean, it's, it's missing the word there. So I, I do them a favor. I will do them the favor and add that for them. If they have a negative interaction with the colleague, they will seek to repair it out of respect and value for the relationship. <laughs> I mean, there's a little side comment there. I don't think they, I, me personally, me personally having, having created and burned, not burned, having created and run through many relationships in my career, um, I, my belief is that stable persons, if stable individuals, if they are doing it for stability, are not so much doing it for the relationship. They're doing it for the work because the work is objective out of respect and value for the work. Because if it's the relationship, if the relationship is the root of a negative interaction, then why would they seek to repair it out of respect and value for the relationship? The counterpart to that relationship should seek, should also be seeking to repair it out of respect and value for the work. If we can't agree on getting the work done, if myself and another person are having a negative interaction and we can't come to terms and seek to repair it out of respect and value for the work, I'm not gonna fucking do it for the relationship. I'll smoke your ass. <laughs> <coughs> Anyways, the overall, um, but again, that's just my take on what a stable, on what a stable professional looks like. Um, and and these are gonna be, these are gonna be, uh, very individualized individuals. So I mean, I'm talking corporate cowboy shit here. I'm I'm not talking like middle management. I mean, there are some middle managers who have, uh, the attributes of a corporate cowboy. And yet, they more than likely adhere to. This author's definition of what stability looks like. They do it out of value for the relationship. Where, I mean, if it's for the relationship, I would just do it for the work, man. Like, if, if you're if you're going to stay together, you know, do it for the kids, man. Do it for the future. And the future is the work. The relationship is just the accessory to getting the work done. The overall regulating function that comes with the stable person makes this style less susceptible to reductions in performance level due to internal or external strife. Meanwhile, this same mechanism explains how this style can maintain both strong ambition and strong relationships. Stable individuals can gain social dominance through their attractive style and their goal-based orientation rather than through power-based or coercive techniques. There are two challenges for the stable attachment style. The first is a blind spot for the other attachment styles. It even comes across in the way this chapter is written. There is a subtle implication that a secure base is the right or the only way. This is not the case. However, those with a strong, stable attachment may be unaware of the other styles around them and how those styles impact their colleagues. What may seem easy for the stable person may be a challenge for another style, and the stable person may not appreciate that difference. It is often unawareness, not arrogance, that leads to this perception. Stable individuals can improve their standing with others by looking through the lens of attachment styles and trying to be aware and understanding of the three other styles. The second challenge for the stable attachment style is related to empathy. Recent research related to attachment styles and leadership, we will discuss further in chapter eight in parentheses there, indicate that the lack of fundamental awareness of the other three attachment styles combined with the blind spot mentioned above can equate to a perceived lack of empathy or an actual lack of empathy, especially during times of change. And that makes sense. I've actually found myself uh, in that position before uh, where I I took on a more stable frame, right? And uh, as change was happening in the organization, I'm just rolling with the punches, man. I'm just, I'm just coasting. I'm just coasting with the good times, letting the good times roll 
Why? Because change for the most part is good. Change shakes up an organization. And whenever an organization is shaken up, it lets you know, it, well, it lets me know because I'm a fucking corporate cowboy. I got my eye out on, I got my eye out for motherfuckers who can't handle change, especially motherfuckers who are getting paid more than me, higher up, got better rank. If they can't handle change, baby, you're in the crosshairs. You're on the fucking chopping block. Or, or if you go back further in the podcast, um, to the episode of how to set up your boss, how to set up your manager, or you could, you could set up your manager. You could set up your manager for success, for success or failure. But that's just, you know, corporate cowboy shit. The autonomous person. Autonomous individuals often come to work with relatively low anxiety and without much, if any, desire for social interaction. This attachment style is often characterized by individuals who have difficulty building relationships with others. The autonomous attachment style emerges from those who have learned to cope without much support or nurturing. They tend to operate on their own with high goal orientation and they tend to believe that they do not need close relationships for success. In fact, the autonomous person often values this independence and self-reliance as parts of their personality. The autonomous person can send the message that they are closed for business. Since they do not value high relationships, they do not seek them. This type can have a high degree of distrust. They also worry about the possibility of rejection and in turn put up barriers. In parentheses here it says consciously or subconsciously. That will deter others from building connections. Even if the autonomous person is working well with a colleague, the slightest hint of rejection may cause the autonomous to break the relationship. This can become reinforcing. This can become reinforcing cycle. Uh, this it's misworded here. This can become a reinforcing cycle of loneliness. This can become reinforcing cycle of loneliness this can become a reinforcing a self-reinforcing let's, let's call it that this can become a self-reinforcing cycle of loneliness for the autonomous employee as the only way to accomplish work becomes through self-sufficiency yeah yeah i like the way i edited it <laughs> The uh, autonomous person often ends up working alone, making it even harder to develop the important social relational networks to create stickiness within an organization. The result is a perception that these autonomous individuals have a high view of themselves and a negative view of others. These perceptions can be reinforced by the belief that the autonomous must protect themselves. Whereas many may view an autonomous person as aloof, they may view themselves as reflective or mission-focused. It can lead to team members feeling abandoned or disrespected without the autonomous person even appreciating that it happened. Therefore, the autonomous person can be incredibly productive, even a high performer, but can negatively impact overall productivity of the organization through their behavior. Didn't. So just a little commentary. Didn't the uh, the description above for the stable person say though that even even a stable person, even the stable individual can work alone or in a team, depending on if collaboration was required or if better value would be derived. Like didn't I mean me personally, I would still stick with stability. I would rather be a stable person, but. But even the, the stable person has attributes of autonomy. So, I mean, I, I, I want to say the, the conclusion to these four quadrants, and, and I haven't read ahead yet. I'm reading this for the first time with you all here. I want to say, and I'm going to uh, foresee it, I'm going to foreshadow it, that the four quadrants actually meld into one another. They, there is some overlap in the four quadrants and not... Uh, and and one person won't find themselves solely uh, in, in the center or deep into one quadrant only. I mean, it's usually best to be in the middle of things anyways. So, if, I mean, if we're splitting up the quadrants in four, I would like to be at the origin. That's 
zero zero for my uh, my graphical nerds. <laughs> the result is a perception that these autonomous individuals have a high view of themselves, bop, 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 despite the emphasis on the negative. There it is. Despite the emphasis on the negative, the autonomous style has positive attributes. The economy has many roles that benefit from such a task-focused mindset. While teamwork and managerial functions may be difficult for the autonomous individuals, that makes sense because it sounds like their communication style fucking sucks. While teamwork and managerial functions may be difficult for the autonomous individuals, there are many positive roles for autonomous individuals. Data-driven roles where judgment and problem-solving reign supreme will appeal to the autonomous person and will not challenge the relationship-weary side. Moreover, these individuals can also seem quite calm in the face of extreme challenges due to their dispassionate, almost distant approach to the problem at hand. A, it's called being uh, cold-blooded. <laughs> A simple way for autonomous individuals to engage effectively with coworkers and colleagues in collaborative settings is to turn the process into one of intertwined cogs in the machinery. Imagine that without the other individual's skills and information, it would be impossible to accomplish the task. If this is true, then the autonomous person may be able to collaborate effectively simply out of the sheer necessity of the process. And I, I guess if we want to apply that directly to the working world, that's, that's email. That's email. That's email or text, I guess, and even more modern. Even more, uh, I'm going to say technologically advanced. Yeah, let's say technologically advanced. I mean, because text is, is still super casual. And not many people have uh, or share their personal, their personal cellular numbers. It's usually through email. And email provides that, that, that distance and... It's, I mean, there's a physical distance and there's a temporal distance there because it gives you time to actually plan out what you're going to say and have it be objective oriented only and not get caught up in feelings and having to create relationships, which is why um, networking, social networking, I mean like professional networking, not social networking because social networking can be confused, can be conflated with social media. But as far as like professional networking goes, it was much more difficult uh, when folks were were locked up for um, for 2020. Or was it 2021? Yeah, I fucking forget now. For 2020, because of that additional distance, especially professionals who who are better capable of just uh, I don't know judging your book by its cover or doing the preliminary research, and even though you have a contemporary opportunity, right? They can't see that on paper or they choose not to uh, provide or, or open that door and just, you know, we'll, we'll go ghost on you. Uh, yeah, just professional networking. In the, in the time of digital communication is somewhat harder if you don't already have uh, clout and a reputation. The distracted individuals. Distracted individuals are high on engagement. They, I bet they get high on engagement too if they're about distractions and drama. In fact, they are so high on engagement that sociability and relationships become a hallmark of their work. <laughs> Did I not say that? I just said that. They often have such strong relationships in parentheses or even just a single very strong... What? Single very strong single relationship... Or even just a single, very strong single relationship. Um, or even just a very strong, or even just a very strong single relationship. How's that? They often have such strong relationships or even just a very strong single relationship that drives their engagement in the organization. This can be incredibly, this can be an incredibly strong form of attachment to the organization because the distracted individual has close acquaintances at work. 
the distracted attachment style can become detrimental because the distracted individual can lean on a single close acquaintance so heavily as to become dependent on another person. The distracted person has not only high engagement, but also high anxiety, and the distracted person can use another as the offset for their own deep concerns. As a result, the distracted person can demonstrate a sense of low or minimal self-worth and constantly seek validation from one or many other people. A distracted person may not have effective boundaries and may be very open about their anxieties with the people around them because they're distracted, man. They want that fucking drama, so they're going to spread drama. They're, they may be they may be very open, nah, because... No, sir, they are very open. They are, not maybe, they are very open about their anxieties with the people around them. This can be draining for a team and lead to a negative cycle of distancing from the person. Not my words, the author's words. When it comes to network, sorry, <laughs> I'm thinking of networking. <coughs> I'm thinking of hustle, when it comes to workplace activities, the person may seem more concerned with looking right than doing right. Yup, yup, like a distracted, dramatic person would. Fucking drama queens, man. A distracted person. Why? Why am I hating on this distracted person? I mean, they're they're good for some. They're 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 uh, they serve some purpose. A distracted person can become so dependent on the affirmation of others as to lose perspective on the objectives of work. Seen it. I, see, well, I think we've all seen it. I'm going to shut up now. Such an extreme case may not speak up in meetings or take independent positions in discussion without seeing which way the team is going. Such individuals may not even take on tasks or responsibilities unless they believe they will receive positive feedback for the activity. Distracted individuals can't struggle with productivity because they are doing what they perceive to be the right thing to please others instead of to meet the job expectations. Damn, you notice how I, I even took on the energy of a distracted person there because distracted people just fucking rile me up sometimes, man. Like having to deal with them, I'd rather fire them. I'd rather... Sh I'd rather not shoot first, ask questions later. I'll ask questions, but then passively fire them. Like I, I will ask the questions and the answer coming out of their, their mouth, I will walk them into coaching themselves out. I'm, I'm like I'm saying, I'm thinking of hustling and, and if I have to hustle to remain stable, to remain autonomous and not distracted, I'm going to do that. However, the distracted attachment style is common and has a great deal of value. Let's fucking hear this. First, it is rarely extreme. Many people score low on avoidance and have a low to medium anxiety score that would place them in the distracted box compared to a fully stable position. This lower form of anxiety might be called imposter syndrome and might come with a healthy questioning of the positional authority of the person. Second, sounds like that's something world leaders need. World leaders need a fucking imposter syndrome. <laughs> world leaders. Who fucking gave them that title, dog? Second, this mild form of anxiety, along with high sociability, can be highly attractive for teams and co-workers, as it is often the core of humble and servant leadership. A mild form of anxiety. I mean, uh, yes, if, if they're facilitating, yeah. I mean, if, if they are facilitating through their sociableness, then yes. Third, the distracted person does create strong attachments with organizations and people, which can be incredibly valuable for building the culture of an organization. This commitment to people and institutions is a value that can... That what? That can... It's missing the can. I added that shit. It, yeah, it, they fucked it up and left the can out. This commitment to people and institutions is a value that can be nurtured. Can be nurtured toward positive and effective engagement in an organization with coaching around appropriate boundaries. The distracted attachment style has great 
value during change. More to come in chapter 8 related to the relationship between leaders and followers, but it is significant to note that strong attachments to the organization and or colleagues can provide valuable temporary support for others during transition. And lastly, the insecure. The insecure attachment style leads to high anxiety. As we discovered in chapter two, insecure behavior is a negative extension of the fear emotional system. It becomes activated through poor attachments early in life that led to a cycle of ineffective attachments. This anxiety likely has nothing to do with work, but it becomes a dominant characteristic in the workplace where the insecure person is unable to manage their anxiety effectively. The style is demonstrated above on our chart as high on anxiety and low on engagement. However, in most cases, it is not that these individuals are low on engagement, but that their high anxiety causes them to struggle with engagement. The insecure often want close relationships with both peers and managers. Insecure individuals seek others to support their own validation, but their anxiety makes it difficult to trust others and depend on others for support. So they're thoroughly fucked, y'all. <laughs> insecure individuals seek external validation and yet don't trust that external validation coming in. That's fucking wild. Even though the insecure, I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna deny ever having been insecure, but this sounds like very extreme. This sounds like a secure, like an extremely insecure individual. Even though the insecure may be committed to deep relationships and connection, their deep fear of rejection makes it hard for them to express their feelings. This creates a cycle of distance between the insecure person and others. An insecure, an insecure person's fear leads to skepticism of others that is felt, which results in distance from others and ultimately leads to some cynicism from the insecure person. I mean, I think everybody, everybody experiences it to an extent. And, and I'm not going to deny uh, putting distance between myself and another person because of lack of trust, right? Be because of, of, yeah, because of lack of trust. And that develops uh, to, that leads to, you know, some cynicism. I, I think that's, a, that's a natural process, but uh, it must an individual or one must remain open to new experiences because if you keep going back to the old persons for the sake of the relationship, again, like I mentioned before, if you're going back to old relationships for the sake of relationships and not the work, I mean, you're just, you're fucking begging for it. You're begging for it. You're begging for toxic relationships. Unlike the autonomous and their distance, unlock, hold on. <clears throat> unlike the autonomous, their distance may not be productive, as this style's struggle with anxiety may make them much less productive. There are two possible challenges here for an insecure person. The first is that they will ignore relationships and focus on work, but that the relationships will still be a desire and distraction. As a result, they will not be able to focus on work and will be unable to be productive. The second is that relationships will be sought and reciprocated, but that the insecure person will overthink the relationships due to hypersensitivity. This might lead to the same cynicism, but through exhaustion and burnout. <laughs> Yo, insecure people. Insecure people fuck themselves doubly, I guess is what it's saying. Insecure people fuck themselves twice. Despite all the concerns expressed about the insecure type, these individuals can provide value in organizations. Let's hear it. The insecure person's desire to stick to people and an organization is laudable. That means it's, uh, it's, it's commendable to an extent. They want to be a part of a team, so force them into team settings. Damn, that, that's a fucking direction right there. They want to be part of a team, so force them into team settings. It is incumbent on, upon leaders. It is incumbent upon leaders to leverage their contributions and their skills while mitigating some of their potential challenges. However, it may not be wise to put them on long-term projects until they build some confidence in an organization. 
let them build up trust in multiple places across an organization to build attachment to the organization and not to a single person or a team. That sounds right. That sounds right. You want to have, you want to have, uh, you, you, want, you want to put this person, if not have them on a rotating team, rotate the person onto different teams so that the common theme is the organizational mission, is organizational values. And that way they're not getting hung up on just a, a single person who might have been like their work partner or something like that, or a team that they, that they later uh, grow insecurely attached to this one work team. So either a rotating team or rotating individual. This style type needs open communication to support trust and needs opportunities to build their rapport with others. Research on effective teams suggests that each team should have a team skeptic that pushes back on the assumptions of the group. An insecure person might effectively, might effectively play that role in a smaller group, serving to push back on others for what may be un for <laughs> Did I just grow retarded? What the fuck? <clears throat> <I'm in. clears throat> Research on effective teams suggests that each team should have a team skeptic that pushes back on the assumptions of the group. An insecure person might effectively play that role in a smaller group, serving to push back on others for what may be the unanswered questions or confusing information in the group and using this approach to build trust with others. I actually agree. Imagine that. If they are insecure, I think the best way to confront insecurity is, is through uh, exposure therapy. Exposure therapy. Yes. So let them get their questions out there. Let them have their answers, their questions answered. But but once they are answered, they should internalize those answers for the good of the organization. Or at least at least for the good of the team. If they're if they are and, and even in the most in the most um, primordial, I guess the most primeval sense for themselves, for the good of themselves to internalize it, right? Why? Because that internalization of the answer is trust, right? So they have to trust themselves that they got the right answer and are able, are capable of using that right answer before they can build trust with others. And I mean, that comes, that comes through, uh, through continuous exposure. So let them get their, their questions answered. Answer their questions politely. Answer their questions amiably, amicably. For the sake of the organization, for the sake of the work, for the value of the work. Otherwise, they're asking redundant questions. If they become repetitive and, and or redundant, I mean, some redundancy is good, right? It's Better to be safe than sorry, I, I guess, I suppose the saying goes. But uh, if they become repetitive with every new situation that comes up, because there's no way of being repetitive with new situations. If new situations come up where past principles can be transposed over and just applied directly, but yet the same questions are recurring like they just have the recurring questions with a new situation, and I've, and the reason I the reason I'm good at describing it is because I've worked, as I've trained someone who's like, every fucking shift was a blank slate again, and I'm like, damn, does this nigga, does this motherfucker have amnesia, retrograde fucking amnesia, like, but no, there's just some individuals who who get locked up, who no who who get, who's Mental processes bind up. There you go. How about that? Because I mean, I've worked with locked up individuals too, and they're actually gung ho for the work. They're so fucking down. But then you work with these retrograde amniagic motherfuckers that <laughs> whose mental processes fucking bind up when they, in the face of of a new issue, of of a new problem, but with similar issues with like similar circumstances, like just slightly nuanced circumstances. And I'm like, damn, bro, like you really can't, you really can't adapt, can you? And damn, that motherfucker had to be coached out.
sooner or later, folks got to get coached out. All right, the great box exercises. This is the attachment style index, and it's this shit's copyrighted, so that's good. By the way, no rights, no no copyrights are claimed for this work. Obviously, it's written by somebody else and just narrated by yours truly. This attachment style index, in quote in parentheses, is the ASI. The attachment style index ASI is a unique survey tool designed around the concepts of attachment styles and the impact they have in the workplace. Unlike other tools, the ASI gets away from the relationship-based questions of other attachment style assessments and professionalizes the concepts for the workplace. The tool is comprised of 25 questions that are a combination of quantitative and qualitative questions. The ASI uses a seven-point Likert scale and can be administered in eight to 10 minutes. The quantitative questions are standard and have been statistically validated for both value and exclusivity over years of research. The qualitative questions vary based on the organizational scenario. The ASI results for the organization define a distinct perspective on both the individual and more broad organizational attachments. The ASI leads, sorry, the ASI yields, yields a report on each person's attachment style and the aggregate styles of the organization. These can be viewed by department, division, or team. Man, my mind was going there too. This is, I mean, this is kind of why I like social science in, in a sense and, and me having graduated from sociology, organizational studies to be more exact. Uh, this shit is right up my alley. That's why I'm reading it. That That's why, I mean, I, I find the material to be much more interesting than than, than just general emphasis sociology, than, than just plain Jane sociology because uh, that, like plain Jane sociology? Nah, not plain Jane. I mean, plain Jane sociology is fucking base too. It's lit as fuck. But um, I mean, modern day, modern day sociology. I'm not, I'm not that late of a graduate. I uh, graduated in the in the late teens, um, late twenty late twenty teens. Uh, the mainstream sociology is more where you get into like underwater basket weaving and, and just super illogical courses. The ASI yields a report on each person's attachment style and the aggregate styles of the organization. These can be viewed by department, division, or team, depending on the most appropriate breakdown of the context. Since 2018, the ASI has been used across over 16 organizations and has been administered to more than 2,000 individuals in four countries. Over the years, we consistently observed that there is no one correct attachment style. Different styles can thrive in different organizations and in different situations. In fact, as we will discuss in Chapter 8, different styles work with different leaders too. Often, the ASI is used in situations of current or future change. Leaders find the ASI valuable in identifying the characteristics of individuals that will influence others during change and those that will be more readily accepted or resist. Hold on. Leaders find the ASI valuable in identifying the characteristics of individuals that will influence others during change and those that will be, and those, I, I fucked up that last sentence. Leaders find the ASI valuable in identifying the characteristics of individuals that will influence others during change and those that will more readily accept or resist change based on their attachment styles. Hmm. Hmm. How to think about attachment styles at work. There is no one right type of attachment style. The highly autonomous can provide value to the highly charged work environment by bringing balance to what might be an extremely dramatic workspace. Conversely, the distracted might provide support to those who are equally struggling with anxiety, but unable to be social enough to discuss their concerns. There is no one right type of attachment style and each provides different value in different situations. However, attachment styles have been underserved as a tool for assessing individuals in the workplace. 
there are five areas where attachment styles have proven predictive of their of there are five areas where attachment styles have proven predictive of other behaviors organizations try to assess and these are personality types work tactics collaboration ethics and behavior during organizational change Attachment styles and personality types. Studies have shown that attachment styles may serve as the backbone of the common personality types that many organizations already test as part of professional development programs. Many personality tests assess some version of the big five personality traits, which anchor to five factors of personality. And these are openness to openness to experience and uh This is uh, indicative of inventive slash curious versus consistent slash cautious. Conscientiousness, indicative of efficient slash organized versus extravagant slash careless. Extroversion, indicative of outgoing slash energetic versus solitary slash reserved. The next point is agreeableness. And that's indicative of friendly slash compassionate versus critical slash rational. And the last is neuroticism, indicative of sensitive slash nervous versus resilient slash competent. The big five, like attachment styles, emerge in our youth and remain constant through most of our life. Studies that compare subjects on both ratings of attachment style and the Big Five demonstrate a clear association between the approaches. Perhaps, unsurprisingly, stable individuals score lower on neuroticism and higher on extroversion while having higher levels of conscientiousness. Consistent with our descriptions above, the insecure and autonomous both have higher associations with neuroticism. The two styles also have a lower connection to extroversion and conscientiousness. The difference between the insecure and autonomous is around agreeableness, where the autonomous are significantly less likely to demonstrate agreeableness than the stable or insecure. And I think in my mind, just a side note, it's because the autonomous are more independent-minded, whereas the stable, uh, the, the stable's more the facilitator, and the insecure uh, is more the follower. There does not appear to be a strong distinction between the different styles when it comes to openness to experience. Attachment style and work tactics. In a fascinating study of over 500 undergraduate students at a large Midwestern university, Patricia Hawley et al. sought to answer the question of whether attachment styles led to individuals led to how individuals would engage others in their goal attainment strategies. The group of researchers wanted to understand why some people use coercive behaviors such as aggression and power to persuade others to move toward their goals compared to those that use more social and attractive approaches of persuasion. They found there were five types of tactical thinkers. Just a heads up, I want to take notes. There are the low tacticians, who are low in both coercive and pro-social tactics. There are the average tacticians, average in both coercive and pro-social tactics. The pro-social tacticians, who use the pro-social tactics more than their peers. There are the coercive tacticians, who use the coercive tactics more than their peers, and then there are the dual tacticians, who use both the coercive and pro-social tactics more than their peers. Notice how, how, how even the low tacticians have tactics, you feel me? Don't get caught lacking out here, folks. Do not get caught lacking. If you aren't developing professionally to be a better tactician, to use logic and tact, like I said, I mean, this has been an a recurring theme. This has been a theme that's been strung through the entire podcast. It's logic and tact. Professional development in order to better to make better use of logic and tact.
And in doing so, I mean, first it's the acquisition of knowledge, and then it's the application of said knowledge. The researchers found that attachment styles effectively explained the tactical choices of many participants. Coercion seems to be a sign of the autonomous. Both the coercive and dual tacticians aligned with the autonomous style. Their high sense of self-worth, self-worth, confidence, and willingness to engage with people, but their lack of close relationships allows this type to freely move between more aggressive behavior to achieve their goals and more social behavior when it aligns with their objectives. Yes, I like that. Both the coercive and dual tacticians align with the autonomous style. I like, I like the ability. I can appreciate the, I can appreciate being a dual tactician. The ability of, of employing, of deploying the two tactics, both coercive and pro-social. Why? Because there's going to be moments when uh, all you got, or I guess, yeah, all, all you got is word of mouth. All you got is a gift to gab. And you have to find just the right string, just the right chain of words in order to either avoid conflict or facilitate business, you know, keep things from boiling over or, or to uh, persuade and, and exude enthusiasm, you know? And then there's the coercive where, I mean, if the words don't work, you got guns to back it up. <laughs> their high sense, their high sense of self-worth Confidence and willingness to engage with people, but their lack of close relationships allows this type to freely move between more aggressive behavior to achieve their goals and more social behavior when it aligns with their objectives. The risk with this group is that the social behavior may be based more in deception, gossip, information gathering, as the autonomous will deploy the pro-social tactics only as a means of using people as a resource towards their goal attainment. And I'm going to I'm going to agree with that. I'm going to agree with that because even though it can be used for deception, I would much rather I would much rather just, you know, be straightforward um, taking folks at face value, but there are just some folks that you take at face value and then later have to come back and cash checks, cash checks that they wrote that, you know, we had to bounce back off of their fucking face. <laughs> All right. Um, this will uh, hold up. They will use charm when it works and force when charm fails. Think Machiavelli. I mean, on the other hand, the pro social tacticians leverage their relationships for equal attainment of self and others. Their profile aligns with the stable style, and they tend to think about how to engage others for win-win goal achievement. Hell yeah. As a dual tactician, you got to think win-win always. Win-win always. And if not, I mean, fuck it. Then just win. Just win. Because uh, you, you want to be dead certain. You want to be dead certain that the side you are on is producing good, is producing right, is righteous, Otherwise, I mean, it doesn't matter how you, it doesn't matter, and I've seen this in action before, it doesn't matter how you angle at wanting to win. I mean, somebody will catch you lacking. You, you will come up short. And that's, nah, that's on God, man. The stable lack concerns of betrayal and loss of relationship. So they value the social tie as much as the goal attainment. The stable style may also lead someone to lack a preference for tactics. Both the low and average tacticians demonstrate moderate engagement, good confidence, and low levels of anxiety in the Hawley study. This suggests that the stable may drive pro-social tactics and may have modest ambitions that lack the need for a strong preference in tactics. I mean, and that means that, that the stable will make do with what they have, essentially. You know, it's a whole lot of fucking words, right? 
and and they're they're you know they're high up there I guess in academic trying to make it sound dense and deep for this book. But at the end of the day, it just says that the stable person will make do with what they have, make do with what they have, especially if if the low to the average tacticians have even uh, a, a remote even. Even if both the low and average tacticians remotely have any tact, have any tact, and that means that they can employ logic, they can employ logic to at least have them see what the tactic is about and have them agree, have them jump on board. They make do with what they have. Overall, this is not surprising. The stable will often look at achievement in terms of potential gains. As a result, they will engage with others to identify the best way to attain these gains. By comparison, those with higher levels of anxiety, be they insecure or distracted, will fear their own loss. As a result, people around them become like a resource to be leveraged. They will break any sort of social agreements, like psychological contracts, quickly out of fear that someone else is either going to break the contract first or keep them from attaining their goals. Attachment styles and collaboration. Similarly, attachment orientations can predict whether coworkers are likely to help each other. A study of employees within an Israeli telecommunications firm, Geller and Bomberger, monitored how attachment styles predicted relationships and support among newly hired employees. The researchers profiled the new employees and their attachment styles on the experiences and close relationships scale. That's the ECR scale, which is more commonly used for intimacy and relationships. They then assess the value of interactions between the participants by using a pure, a, a peer, peer rating system, not pure, peer rating system to determine whether other employees were helpful and whether that help was significant in the employee's ability to do their job. So that's uh, peer rated. So that means they're rated by their peers, not purely rated. They were rated by their peers, those that they worked more, most closely with. Most close with? Most close? Closest with. There you go. Yeah. The ones they weren't closest with. The study found that the distracted and the insecure struggled helping others, mostly due to their own challenges of anxiety and self worth. Likewise, the autonomous could provide help but it was not as likely to be deemed significant or valuable. Yeah, I mean, it's an autonomous person. They're much more independent. So they could provide the help, but whether or not they've seen the benefit for it, if it's not significant, they're not going to do it. Again, the stable style provided the strongest base for supporting others because the individuals were both low on their own anxiety and able to effectively engage with others. That means they are low anxiety and low avoidance. I would I would assume that they're more prone to being social too, so they're willing to extend a hand for the sake of the work and networking. Attachment styles and ethics. As noted above, what is unique about attachment styles compared to other forms of assessment is the combination of self-perception and perspective on others in a single assessment. The combination of the two views works extremely well when looking at a topic like ethical behavior which relies on beliefs about both self and others. In three separate studies of attachment behavior compared to ethics, the researchers Lumina Albert and Leonard Horowitz found a link between the type of attachment style and ethical behavior. They found a link between the type of attachment style and ethical behavior. Let me guess. <laughs> All right, I'm not gonna guess, I'll read. In two studies, the researchers mailed a consumer behavior survey on ethical behavior to staff at a state university in India and separately to a set of undergraduate students in the United States. The survey presented a series of statements of behaviors to participants and asked the participants to determine whether the behavior was ethical or unethical. For example, in quotes, you find an item you want that is mismarked at a cheaper price. You purchase the product for the incorrect price. 
In a third study, they asked managers in two different industries in India to respond to a different questionnaire about ethics in the workplace, asking them to respond to statements about rule following in the office like, quote, not reporting others' violations of company rules and policies, end quote. The goal of these three studies was to work across cultural lines and organizational rules, in parentheses, between consumers and managers, to get a more generalizable, to, to get to more generalizable findings about attachment styles and ethics. Across all three studies, Albert and Horowitz found that a person's view of others had a strong impact on how they identified ethical behavior. Both stable and distracted, firmly, both stable and distracted, strongly affirmed that the ethical concerns questioned in the survey were in fact wrong. There was only one deviation in the findings, which came in the most severe transgressions of illicit profit, where both the insecure and the distracted were slightly more likely to accept the behavior. This is likely connected to the poor self-image and belief that they may not be willing to stand up for their own convictions against these violations. The most brazen acceptance, I mean, I'm going to I'm going to frame it just this little side No, I, let me finish the sentence. This is likely connected to the poor self-image and belief that they may not be willing to stand up for their convictions against these violations. I, I guess I just repeated that. I already read it. Uh, just a side commentary. I'm, I'm going to say that <clears throat> the insecure and, and the distracted, because they were slightly more likely to accept the behavior, you got to wonder what the questions actually were. I mean, if, if you really want to get contextual and you want to dig deep qualitatively into what the into what the subject matter of the questions we're asking about, you want to you want to find whether or not they asserted some kind of. Um, power dynamic, like some type of authoritative dynamic into the mix, like uh, just an example, for, in quotes, you see your manager mislabeling the product and you sell it to a consumer at that mismarked price, end quote, right? So like if you, you see your manager do it, like would you do it or not? And and even then, that begs the question, like, well, do you let your manager know or or you assume you know, you assume the manager knows what they are doing and fuck it. I mean, you just got to ring through the product or, or else, um, or else, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's your ass. <laughs> you you got to ring through the product to make that sale because if, if you don't have, if you don't have the authority to lower the price, I mean, if you had some, some kind of, you know, some kind of, authoritative control, some kind of span of control on some kind of sphere of control on what the product, what the price is, the manager can put it at whatever fucking price they want. So long as you know what the cost of goods is, what the cost of services is, what your break even price point is, damn, you can just make a dollar. You can make a dollar and a lifelong consumer next time they come back. So, I mean, there's that too. The most brazen acceptance of poor ethical behavior came from the autonomous style. Across all three studies, the autonomous group, mostly men, mostly men, these motherfucking corporate cowboys come in all shapes and flavors, but I guess here they, they, they want to they wanna say mostly men, and, and I'll find the counter to it, watch. Across all three studies, the autonomous group, mostly men, were more willing to accept the unethical behavior. The researcher initially thought these, sorry, the researcher initially thought those with a strong opinion of themselves and poor opinion of others would be more likely to uphold ethic. However, as Albert and Horowitz note, apparently a positive image of self in combination with a negative image of others leaves the person with a bold sense of entitlement, ready to transgress without embarrassment, guilt, or concern about consequences. The impact of this study is that the autonomous may not only be hard to manage within an organization, but you may also need to watch them for unethical behavior. Huh. The autonomous group being uh, the most distant socially, right? 
what will be in the potentially most distant socially. Uh, they're in the category of being able to carry out the job well, being able to carry out the job well, being capable of supporting, but lending little to no support. You know why? Because these motherfuckers are autonomous, yo. And that is mostly men. No, I mean, I don't mean to be sexist, but that that is literally men carving out their own legacy that they, that they got to. Why? Because at the end of the day, if you ain't selling, you ain't eating. If you're not closing, if you're not hunting, if you're not killing, you're not eating. And that's men. And men are willing to take on more risk and at a dollar now if they did like a follow-up survey with their consumers with with those men in, in actuality a, a dollar says that they have that they carry uh exceptional reputations with their customer base whereas i mean we don't see women uh and in, in in, we don't see women uh represented in the autonomous style at least the the researchers don't give us that information but it sounds like women are just following but um, hey, it ain't my it ain't my fucking research, right? I'm just interpreting it. Attachment styles and organizational change. And organizational change is another situation when an understanding of attachment styles can be helpful. Different attachment styles respond to change in different ways. Many approaches to change management focus on moving people through the process of change with an emphasis on creating an awareness and um, an awareness or understanding of the change to create a desire for it. Hold on. Okay, yeah, I understand that now. Many approaches to change management focus on moving people through the process of change with an emphasis on creating an awareness or understanding of the change to create <laughs> it's fucking double creating in there to create a desire for it. So, I mean, yeah, you want to create a desire for change, well, then you have to create an awareness and an understanding of it. That way they can anticipate it and embrace it when it fucking gets there. However, for many people, change is about a loss. And attachment is a process that is anchored to an understanding of loss. As a result, by taking an attachment style's view, we can understand who will be open to change and who will not be open to change. Since the stable individuals are generally resilient, change is not a huge challenge for them. Stable individuals will seek support throughout the organization and focus on problem solving to answer the questions that arise for them. As a result, they tend to feel comfortable with changes early, but that does not mean they are without effort. Yeah, the stable person just makes do with what they got, and they're always expending effort. They're like... They're like... Uh, they, they just make it look easy. They make it look easy. They make it look fun, man. And that's the goal, obviously, is to go through this chaotic process. It's a fucking process. Chaotic process called life. So the end product, death, is just easy and cool. You got to make that shit look cool, man. Even the stable will need a deep rationale, understanding of an organizational change before they will be comfortable with an emotional acceptance of the change. Yeah, I mean, to them, it just got to be logical. It's got to be logical, and you have to do, you have to approach them also with tact. Anything with logic and tact is fucking appetizing. It's tempting. It's savoring. It's, it's savory. You, you definitely want to jump on board. If the idea sounds good and it's well thought out, it's a good idea that's well thought out. Why wouldn't you pursue it? Even the stable need a deep rationale understanding of an organizational change before they will be comfortable with an emotional acceptance of the change. Additionally, the stable regain their confidence quickly during a change, but often find it hard to identify how well others adapt to change. It is important for the stable to connect with others and understand their challenges with change. So yes, even the stable, I mean, yeah, the, 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 the stable just wants to make do with what they got, man. So of course, they're, they're going to get their feelers out. They're going to put their feelers out for how others are doing, for how others are, are, are mitigating uh, uh, large burdens in, the, in this change process. Conversely, the distracted may try to connect for very different reasons. Yeah, probably just the gossip and bullshit. Just the gossip and bitch and whine and complain. Both the distracted and the insecure will feel 
and underlying concern with organizational change as it will challenge their confidence and self-worth, especially in cases of significant change like downsizing, merger, role redefinition. However, the distracted will try to connect with many people for reassurance and emotional support. Great. Now they're going to distract more fucking people. <laughs> I don't mean to be an asshole. I don't mean to be an asshole, but like there's just some folks who who weren't who who weren't brought up to handle change, man. And and I, I'm not blaming them. I I might blame their parents, but that shit might be even be generational how they were brought up, right? So there comes a time where you give them as many chance as required, but if it doesn't stick to them, right? If 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 <laughs> If the positive attributes of change, having learned it, having gone through it and experienced it, if they don't stick the next time a new change comes up, remember, like if a new situation pops up that's got similar circumstances and similar issues and they are unable to adapt, they're fucking liability, bro. They're fucking liability, homie, and you don't want that on the team. However... <laughs> the distracted will try to connect with many people for reassurance and emotional support. They need a safe space with safe people, bruh. <laughs> this role as connectors may actually make them good leaders during change activities. Um. Oh yeah, I, I, I do. Re I do recall. I do recall they referenced that a little earlier, a couple paragraphs up where they weren't necessarily putting the most distracted, the most drama driven. Um, but, uh, but also because they're, they're slightly more sensitive. They're slightly, they're, they're more sensitive to the needs of the team that, that might be it, um, between the distracted and the insecure. They're, they're going to be slightly more sensitive to the needs of the team. And that's always good. I mean, the, the needs of the team, if, if your team is eaten, you're eaten. If, if you're eaten and your team's not eaten, your team's hungry, fam, and they're eyeing you. <laughs> this role, <clears throat> this role as connectors may actually make them good leaders during change activities. That healthy, quote unquote, imposter syndrome mentioned before may make them effective and empathetic leaders. Empathetic, that means that they got empathy and communicators for others experiencing the change. They become more empathetic listeners and communicators. Empathetic listeners and communicators. I can appreciate that. I've been through it. I mean, I'm at a point in my life, I'm what, 30 and change? I'm at a point in my life where you have to wear many hats, run many shoes, man. And I mean run, not walk them out. Run, motherfucker. Shoes, sandals, and boots, man. You got to fucking... Run. <laughs> the insecure will likely withdraw and play out their own worst scenarios without much conversation or collaboration. Yeah, man, they just they just close in, they shut in and, and shut down. Poor guys, man. The insecure. I mean, I, I really do feel bad. I, I feel I feel I feel worse for the insecure than I do for the distracted. I mean, because the insecure, like I said, are are fucking themselves doubly, are fucking themselves twice. Where they're distracted, it just they just like getting, they like getting fucked over. They need to get fucked over because they live off of drama. They need the drama in order to feel validated. You feel me? Anyways, the autonomous may also withdraw, but may do so believing that they can quote unquote solve the change on their own, and or it will not apply to them in the same way. Yeah, the the, the, the autonomous seems more like a like a lone wolf. And I could dig it. I mean, I could dig it because even wolves hunt in packs sometimes. Any withdrawal is an attempt to save face and protect themselves from the potential negative feelings related to the forthcoming change. Yeah, I mean, withdrawal from any point in life is just an attempt to save face. It's an attempt to save face and or, and or to save the face because they don't want to interact. And I get it. Interaction can be tiring. But networking is unceasing. Exercise box, a little gray box says, managing attachment styles during change. Over the course of the last 10 years, the central government in United Kingdom reduced fundings 
for local councils, reduced funding for local councils, local councils. I'm assuming those are like the jacks, those are like the peas in, uh, in the U.S., the projects. Over the course of the last 10 years, the central government in the United Kingdom reduced funding for local councils. Damn, no wonder the UK looks like shit. Local councils' responsibilities include education, housing, social care for the elderly, local roads, and waste recollection. And waste, and waste collection. So local councils got a lot, man. They got a lot on their plate and little to do it with. In 2017, a Financial Times article stated that the LGA, the Local Government Authority of Local Government, as a whole in the UK would have 15.7 billion pounds less central funding by 2020. Against this challenging financial and political landscape, local governments across the UK faced a significant change management challenge. There was now a continuous need to restructure and rationalize services based upon the available financial envelope. One Northern England-based county identified a change management framework and supporting data collection strategy as a proactive step to manage the process. The attachment style index was used to define and track the organization's intent to implement and subsequently embrace challenge within the local council. I, just a side note, I like, I like how this is written and, it, and it's worded. It's worded like, one Northern England-based county identified a change management framework. Oh, the county identified it? Nah, really? Like, so they take the spotlight off of those fucking individuals in that county and just say, oh, the county. Like, this fucking, this, it's this area of land, this, this square kilometerage of land fucking identified the change management framework. Nah, B. It was People, it was individuals, it was politicians and and social researchers. But you don't think they're actively socially experimenting on folks? Come on, fucking grow up. The attachment style index was used to identify and track the organization's intent to implement and subsequently embrace change within the local council. Yeah, it's a government program. Why wouldn't they? They got free people. They got free, uh, free subjects. You guys are so... <laughs> The ASI was initially administered in September 2016 using quantitative and qualitative questions. This real-time data provided the council with a custom perspective of the change impact on their team based on the respective attachment styles. Another side note, whether or not this made the living the living conditions in the in the in the local councils, whether or not it made the living conditions better is up for debate. Right now, what they're focusing on is finding whether or not this this data, this real-time data provided by the internal operations of the council, by the internal changes of the council, were successful, and and whether or not they changed the individuals in within their within their job descriptions and their positions on the council. The data proactively informed the management team's strategy. One significant example of the data-driven strategy was the need to establish more transparent communication. The behavior shift was a transition for the organization that ultimately provided a more defined foundation to build increased trust. I mean, yeah, more communication equals more trust. That's pretty obvious, but it's got to be the right type. Tran transparent or not, I mean, there's a way to spin it. There's a way to interpret it. During December 2017, the ASI was administered a second time to monitor a larger cohort of employees within the organization. This follow-up survey extended beyond the organizational leadership and demonstrated the positive impact of the change management strategy. Despite having a broad range of attachment styles, the county leadership was moving the organization in the right direction. The leadership team credited the success to the proactive identification of attachment styles and the effective management of styles by the county leadership. And again, it, it's, that was it. That's the end of that block right there. It's not letting you know whether or not the, the local government authority was more efficient in their work for the local councils. It's just, it's just saying 
that uh, that the ASI was successful in in the management. And if what we're talking is is how to better administer less money for local councils, then yeah, I'm sure they were successful because they can just rationalize it with any fucking excuse. There is no right attachment style. In his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey outlines the process of building from a secure base, quote unquote, a secure base to a state of self-mastery. Easier said than done. His lesson is to build from dependence to independence before trying to become interdependent. As we have seen, this just may not be the way we as humans are wired to interact. Interdependence is part of the human brain. With some people, sorry, and some people may emerge to the working world. Hold on. I think that's worded wrong. And some people may emerge to the working world with a solid, secure base, while others may not. This whole fucking sentence is, is, has errors out the ass, and I'm doing my best to edit them in real time and just read them as I believe they should be. And some people may emerge to the working world with a solid, secure base, while others may not, and they can all have value. That does not mean that individuals will struggle with their respective organizations. There is no right attachment styles. Each of the styles described provides different benefits for different types of roles. Table 4.1 below shows some of the characteristics that emerge as strengths for each of the attachment styles to consider. Uh, yeah, Table 4.1 below shows some of the characteristics that emerge as strengths for each of the attachment styles to consider as you think about how to apply these lessons in your organization. And table 4.1 is uh, just a table of attachment style strengths on the left, all the way on the left hand side, you have two, uh, two broad categories, one for personality, one for behavior. And then you have those uh, five indicators for personality, which are openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeable, and neuroticism, and then the five indicators for behavior, which are coercive, pro-social, collaborative, high ethics, change leaders, and detailed work. It's pretty much, uh, uh, that's on, on the, all the way, on, on the column on the left. Now, on the top rows, you have the four attachment styles, which are stable, autonomous, distracted, and insecure, and essentially what you have is a matrix and they've put X's where the um, attachment style and the personality and behavioral traits intersect. So for like, I mean, I, I'll read them off for, for stable, for stable, wherever I read a word, that's where you'll find an X. That's where they intersect as far as personality goes. So for a stable personality, they got conscientiousness and extroversion, stable behavior. They have pro-social, collaborative, high ethics, and change leaders. And that, that's already described above, but you, you want to make these notes. Autonomous, the personality trait is neuroticism. That's an X there. And then for autonomous behavior, you have coercive and detailed work. Coercive, and then at the bottom, detailed work. For the distracted attachment style, in the personality attributes, you have extroversion and agreeable. And then for behavioral attributes, you have high ethics and change leaders. High ethics and change leaders. And then for the insecure attachment style, personality attributes, you have neuroticism. And then the insecure behavior attributes just the one attribute you have detailed work and yeah that makes sense i mean they're insecure people are some insecure people are borderline some insecure people are borderline perfectionists and uh even then it, it's just unceasing with them like you have to tell them when to stop sometimes the lesson the lesson is that the attachment styles can save organizations a lot of other kinds of research on employees. Attachment styles are cognitive based on the intuitive functions of the brain. 
which means they are not likely to change or be learned over time. For this reason, attachment styles present lasting indicators of the strengths and risks of employees or potential employees who are about to go through a significant organizational change. By using attachment styles, the organization can learn how to support these employees more effectively through their work and the process of change. All right, got a little practice exercise for us. It's in the gray box. I'll read it real quick because, um, I mean, we still, we still got, what is this, two or three pages? So, and this practice exercise is, the, the exercise is to collect. And it's an attachment styles questionnaire. The considerations in table 4.2 are not the attachment styles index. This is not a scientific tool, but it can quickly help you try to get a sense of where you might fall on attachment style. Check off the boxes below, honestly, and see where you have the most alignment. And then table two, table 4.2 below just has uh, attachment style considerations. And on the column on the left, you have a series of phrases uh, similar to, uh, I mean, similar to the ASI that was provided in those uh, international countries and those international organizations to find their attachment styles at different levels. And then the top row is, uh, is again, those four different attachment styles as to whether or not they pertain to stable, autonomous, distracted, and insecure. So the first one on the left states, I do not enjoy tackling tasks that are completely new to me. The second is, it is difficult for me to be alone. If alone, I feel stressed, abandoned, hurt, and or angry. The third is, I find myself minimizing the importance of close relationships in my life. The fifth is, I often expect the worst to happen in my relationships. Number six, I feel comfortable expressing my own needs at work. Number seven is, I feel that people are essentially good at heart. And then you would apply, you would apply this attachment styles. Now that you have a sense of yourself, it's saying, what are you going to do about it? Below is a playbook for you to work through the strengths and weaknesses of your style. So you want to take it to scale. If you want to engage a team in a dialogue, think about having the team go through the questionnaire above and then mix and match the respondents based on their styles. Have each group discuss what they learned about themselves and how their strengths may help the rest of the team and what kind of support they may need from the rest of the team to support their personal weaknesses. So for the stable, the stable can self-coach to maintain awareness of anxieties others may be experiencing, self-coach to listen appreciatively and respond authentic authentically, they can create structured feedback sessions with defined actions to address feedback, maximize opportunities to interact with other leaders to share your confidence and optimism. You may be a good candidate to lead public forums, structure project planning to include defined risk identification and management that you are aware of and appreciate the need to address real challenges. You will lose credibility with others if you appear unrealistically confident. <laughs> so again, don't fucking, don't fake it till you make it. Don't overly fake it because if you overly fake it, people will, will see will see it. And, um, or, or I guess that could be a double-edged sword. If you're just overly enthusiastic, there's some, there's some motherfuckers out there who are like unreal on the enthusiasm or incredible. I mean, th those are two absolutes, but like they, they just appear, they appear unreal and they appear incredible. And, um, I mean, they, they could be hard to get it. They could be hard to work with or hard to start a, re a working relationship with. But when you start, bro, like if, if you're able, like, if you could, if, if you could, yeah, if you could, if I could shit, if one could, if one could have an overly enthusiastic person on their side, man. That's like, it's like one having the brain and the other having the gun, man. Arm and hammer. How about that? Use your growing energy and confidence to support others. Leverage concrete success stories to promote the change. Be conscious of the risk of operating too independently. 
Check in regularly with other leaders on their agendas and their priorities to make sure you are aligned and have not missed possible conflicts or opportunities for joint action. I mean, yeah, you got to be a facilitator. As a stable person, you have to always, always be looking for that next lick. Why? Because stability is just having your hands and in, in, in all the right things. Make sure to avoid setting up situations where you operate in a silo as an individual and without collaboration. Yeah, a stable person needs, uh, needs many, many connections to remain stable. I mean, a stable person can be stable by themselves, right? But they're obviously able to better distribute distribute that stability right because uh, to a certain extent even stability can be a uh, can appear as a weakness to some you never want to have the appearance of it but on occasion one might appear one might appear might one might have to appear weak in order to facilitate so you never want to avoid setting up situations where you operate in a silo therefore you must appear to need a team that's what that's saying. Your self-confidence and trust in others can lead you to be unaware of other challenges and other conflicting agendas. Your self-confidence and trust in others can lead you to be unaware of other challenges and other conflicting agendas. Autonomous. Learn to observe yourself. The autonomous people. Learn to observe yourself. Honestly review your own instincts, mindset, and behaviors. Practice change of mindset viewing others as valuable contributors to your success, the team's success, and the organization's success. Actively scan for positives in others. Practice gratitude and authenticity, unsolicited positive recognition of others to reframe your relationships. Accept personal accountability for connecting with others and building relationships. You are likely to find unrecognized skills when you practice them. Balance a cool demeanor with an appreciation for the natural anxiety others experience during stress. So you want to balance your cool demeanor with an appreciation for the natural anxiety others feel. For the anxiety others feel. And that's called being empathetic. That's called <laughs> that's called growing empathy. <laughs> don't be so distant, it's saying. It's saying don't be so fucking distant, bruh. You got if you want to be a professional, you gotta to learn to extend a hand sometimes. You gotta shake hands. You gotta step into other pre other person's shoes. Sometimes you gotta wear an another hat. Create routines to promote connection and updates from the team or peers. Focus on positive outcomes and connections. Unawareness of impact on others is critical. You will find it helpful to thoughtfully and mindfully manage your interactions with others and their potential impact on team success in the context of change. Guard against questioning the motives of others. And lastly, your lack of engagement in team efforts may mean that the team will not feel secure with the value of your input to deliberations. Your lack of engagement. So I'll give you a quick example because I've been victim of that before. Victim of circumstance. Or suspect of circumstance. How about that? And that that's... I, I I always say like a like a whenever they say product product of my environment like just those little sayings are like where they put themselves in a victimhood mindset. I fucking hate it, man. You gotta break out of that. So, if I'm a suspect of circumstance, right, and my lack of engagement breeds distrust or breeds insecurity, that's because I'm I'm lacking communication with the team. I haven't built enough rapport with the, my own fucking team where they trust what I say and they understand I mean what I say or like they can view it from our perspective. I mean, I, one could always, right? One could always just keep their mouth shut until the very end and have the best idea with the best presentation, the best oratory skills, the, the perfect combination and chain of words like a motherfucking skeleton key, season one, episode one, and then be able to just you know, not, not even force the idea, not even ram the idea, just slide the idea in, in, in perfect harmony. But at the tail end of like everybody's struggle, right? And maybe, maybe they might, uh, they might feel secure with the value that you're contributing. But that's hard, man. That's hard. That, that needs uh, to be professional on all appearances, on all levels. It, it demands... 
a degree of exactitude, a, a, a degree of professionalism that's unprecedented, unprecedented. And I mean, only the most exceptional people will manage to do that. <clears throat> some some more than others <laughs> some more than others distracted the distracted people learn to observe yourself honestly review your own instincts mindset and behaviors practice the change of mindset viewing how much control others have in a balanced manner and recognizing the control you have over circumstances identify your valuable identify your valuable contributions to your success the team's success and the organization's success Actively scan for positives in your own contributions. Accept personal accountability for making independent decisions where appropriate. Create routines to maintain balanced connections with peers, managers, and others with whom you are highly dependent, with whom you have highly dependent relationships. Pause or reconsider when you feel inclined to connect repeatedly with others over a matter for which you have accountability. Right? It's just saying, don't bring other people into your shit, man. I understand being distracted and having drama in your life is like a set. It, it gives you a sense of productivity, right? It gives you a sense of productivity. But the more people you have involved in the matter that can be handled by yourself, the less productive you become. The more of a liability you become. And the less likely you are to continue with the organization. Practice communicating with confidence to your subordinates. Be planful to ensure... Be planful? <laughs> Is that a word? Be mindful. I'm going to say be mindful to ensure that... Because it's written as planful. Be mindful to ensure that you are delivering sufficient positive messaging about the organization's ability to handle change. And then make sure to develop healthy boundaries with others. Now... The insecure, the insecure, invest in positive mindsets about a self and others, about yourself and others. Reflect on positive experiences. Learn to scan for personal successes and positive movements that reveal authentic esteem and approval by peers. Seek opportunities to build and connect. <clears throat> Seek opportunities to connect and build trusting relationships to build confidence. Create open communication in all relationships. Identify your valuable contributions to your success, the team's success, and the organization's success. Actively scan for positives in your own contributions. Accept personal accountability for making independent decisions where appropriate. Create routines to maintain balanced connections with peers, managers, or others with whom you have highly dependent relationships. And lastly, guard Guard against questioning the motives of others. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the recommendation, the suggestion is to use that insecurity of yours, right? To remain productive. Stop questioning the motives of others, right? If you can't control the other, if you can't control others, if they are not your immediate subordinates, don't even go fucking questioning them. See how you can just build. See how you can build on the motives of others. If they're, if they're lateral to you, if they're adjacent to you, if they're side by side, if they're across from you, <laughs> I'm, using, I'm using multiple words to describe the same thing, but if organizationally, if they are the same rank as you, don't fucking question them. They know what they're doing. In their own little world, they have a clue. They must have a clue, otherwise they wouldn't be in the org, right? So stop and guard. Guard against questioning their motives and just seek to build. Continue building bridges. Continue building upward. If their manager ushers them out, if their manager, if their direct supervisor eliminates them, then that's more opportunity. That's more opportunity for responsibility for yourself, maybe. And then you could even find security in the fact that you're still in the organization. Hey, look at that. Look at that. All right, enough chit-chat. Observe pop culture doppelganger. That's another exercise. Observe. The title of this is pop culture doppelganger. Often, popular culture can help us solidify our understanding of concepts. Look at some of these popular television shows in Table 4.3 and see if you can relate to any of these characters. Is the attachment style also relatable? Try using this grid with members of your team. Does this help mystify some of the concepts? Make it easier to talk about how style... Does this help demystify some of the concepts? 
And then oh, the last one is also a question. Make it easier to talk about how styles might make us able to work with each other? Fucking question mark. That's a weird, weirdly phrased uh, question. Table 4.3, I'll describe it in brief. And it's uh, the title of this is Pop Culture Attachment Style Characters. The column all the way on the left is a series going down. It's a series of television shows. They are Peanuts, The Simpsons, Seinfeld, Friends, Everybody Loves Raymond, Sex in the City, The Office, Mad Men, Parks and Recreation, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Gossip Girl, Downtown Abbey, Upstairs, Downtown Abbey, Downstairs, what the fuck? Ted Lasso. I don't know not half of these, man. I don't know not half of these. I don't know half of these. And that's because I didn't watch a lot of TV. But um, fuck it, I'll read it for you. I will read it for you. In the stable category. So, I, I guess I'll, I'll read because the, the, the top row lists the attachment styles, right? One, two, three, four. And then this matrix, essentially, with the left column being the shows and the top row being the attachment styles going down. They create a matrix of which characters fall into which attachment styles for which respective show. So what I'm going to do to make this more comprehensive so you will comprehend and understand it is read the show first and then tell you what the stable, the distracted, the autonomous, the insecure characters are. How about that? So for Peanuts, the stable character is Peppermint Patty. The distracted is Lucy Van Pelt. Autonomous is Schroeder. Insecure is Charlie Brown. Poor Charlie Brown. I, I, I mean, at least I know that one. The Simpsons. Stable is Marge Lisa. Distracted is Homer Smithers. Autonomous is Bart, Mr. Burns. And insecure is Principal Skinner and Moe. I'm assuming it's Mo Shizlek. I recognize that one. I remember that one. Uh, Seinfeld. This, this I know less of. Stable is Kramer. Actually, I do know this one. Watched a couple episodes, I guess. The Distracted is Jerry. The Distracted is Jerry. That's the main character. Autonomous is Lane. Insecure is George. For Friends, also I watched a couple episodes. The Stable is Phoebe. Distracted is Ross. Autonomous is Joey. And Insecure is Chandler. Everybody Loves Raymond. I also watched a couple episodes of. Stable is Deborah. Distracted is Marie. Autonomous, Frank. Insecure is Raymond. Okay. Sex in the City. I watched hardly no episodes of. Stable is Charlotte slash Samantha. Distracted is Carrie. Autonomous, Miranda and Insecure is Stanford Blatch. Stanford Blatch. I don't know if that's one character or two. It sounds like two first names or two last names. <laughs> Stanford Blatch. Uh, I don't know. The Office. Stable is Jim. Distracted is Michael. Autonomous is Stanley. Insecure is Phyllis. Mad Men. Stable is Bert Cooper or Joan Harris. Distracted is Pete Campbell and Peggy Olson. Autonomous is Don Draper, Roger Sterling. And Insecure is Harry Crane. Parks and Recreation. The Stable is Andy Dwyer. The Distracted is Leslie Nope. With a K. Leslie Nope. And Chris Traeger. Autonomous is Ron Swanson, April Ludgate, and Tom Haverford. And the insecure is Ann Perkins. Brooklyn Nine-Nine, the stable is Captain Holt. The distracted is Amy. The autonomous is Rosa. And the insecure is Boyle. Gossip Girl, the stable is Dan Humphrey. The distracted is Serena Vander Woodson. Vander Woodson. The autonomous is Chuck Bass. And the insecure is Blair Waldorf. Downtown Abbey, upstairs, in parentheses. I guess there's two downtown Abbeys, upstairs and downstairs. <laughs> they made a spinoff off of a spinoff. <laughs> All right. 
<laughs> they made they made two spinoffs. I mean, I guess, but a spinoff of the same fucking house, like. Uh, maybe I don't know what downtown Abbey is. I'm assuming like a, like maybe the Abbey is like a like a quarter of the city, maybe. And if there's like an upstairs and a downstairs, like a higher class, a lower class, I don't fucking know. I haven't seen any of that. Uh, the stable and the upstairs. All right, the stable is Tom Branson and Isabel Crowley. The distracted is Lady Edith. The autonomous are Earl Grantham, Lady Mary, and Dowager Countess. And the insecure is Lady Rose. Downtown Abbey downstairs. The stable is Miss Hughes. The distracted is Daisy. The autonomous is Mr. Carson and Thomas Barrow. And the insecure are Mr. M Mosley, Mollesley and Baxter. Mollesley? Mollesley. I think it's Mollesley. And then Ted Lasso, the, the stable is Coach Beard. The distracted are Keeley and Ted Lasso. The autonomous are Jamie Tart and Rebecca. And the insecure is Nate. That wraps up part, what is this, part four? That wraps up part five. This would be part five. So that wraps up chapter four. Chapter four of Stuck, How to Win at Work by Understanding Loss by Victoria Grady and Patrick McCreesh, publisher, Productivity Press, 2022. This has been brought to you in part by Corporate Cowboys Podcast, yours truly, Alex, powered by Incorporating Associates. Keep this operation not for profit by visiting us our, on our Patreon page, subscribing, hitting the links, like, comment, share. We're on Instagram also. You already know what the fucking deal is. You already know what we look like, even if we got ski masks on. We look like you. We're just regular people. You know. <laughs> making a killing. Living life and making a killing. And, um, yeah, help, help us keep this operation on for profit. It always will be, always shall be. So we'll see you, uh, we'll see you at the top, man. Have a nice week.